Good morning, everyone. And uh, hope you're all doing well. I hope you enjoyed yourself so far and that you are kind of settling into the retreat center here. Yeah. Uh, just one very brief announcement before we get into the suit is that there is a, as you approach the double hall from the outside over here, yeah. on the right hand side there's like a small kitchenette or whatever on the right hand side. Yeah. And in there, there's a box and some paper and some pens and things. Uh, and if you want to ask questions, you can write them down on a piece of paper in there. Uh, the idea behind this is just to keep things fairly quiet. And since I will read out the questions, uh, instead of asking questions publicly. Uh, and there will be other opportunities to do like Q&A, uh, you know, more like in, in personal uh, interviews, if you like. Uh, and then we can have more of a chat if you're interested in doing that one. Uh, so that is the uh, little announcement for this morning yeah. and now we can get into the students uh, so uh, as I uh, was mentioning yesterday the idea behind this retreat is to uh, combine meditation practice with understanding the word of the Buddha and uh, uh, so I'm going to start out with a few suttas that are basically if you like background information this is information about why the suttas are insignificant, why they are important, uh, and also about how to know what are the real suttas. If you ask a Buddhist from various backgrounds and various traditions, uh, uh, you will always find that there is a lot of disagreement about what is the word of the Buddha and what is not. So what did the Buddha have to say about this? Yeah, what, what actually are the things that we can find in the sutta when the Buddha talks about what his teachings are and what they are not. So this is the first thing I'd like to do is to look at some of this background information to kind of set the stage for the suttas that come later on uh, and then uh, I get a bit more confidence perhaps uh, that the things that we are looking at are the real deal. Yeah? It's not something that I have kind of whacked together because I like it. But actually, <laughs> this actually is uh, the, the word of the Buddha as far as we know. Uh, so I'm not trying to hoodwink you or trick you or anything like that. That is the kind of what I want to show you so you kind of feel that you can have a, at least trust me a little bit. Uh, maybe not 100%. It's not very good to trust 100%, but at least enough to kind of take on board the students. Uh. And then once we have established that basis, uh, then after that, then the idea is to go on to the students. And the particular thing I want to look at, uh, and this is a thing that I very often teach on these retreats, uh, and this is the thing known as the gradual training. And the gradual training uh, is really about the whole practice of the Buddhist path uh, from the very beginning, from the moment you sit down, or from the moment you hear about the teachings for the first time. Uh, yeah? The first time I think, gee, this, this Buddhism sounds really cool. Yeah? So you go out and you kind of investigate it more. From that point, uh, yeah, from the moment you start to like these teachings, uh, until the moment you reach the very end of the path. Uh, yeah, the end of suffering. Somebody was saying yes, that the end of suffering sounds pretty boring, sounds pretty bland, you know. Certain teachers say, yeah, end of suffering, what are you going to package Buddhism better than that? Uh, and there is a point, a point to that, uh, that Buddhism sometimes isn't packaged or isn't kind of sold very well. Uh, and of course, one of the jobs of being a monastic is to kind of be a PR, PR manager for the students. Uh, yeah? So this is kind of one of my jobs as a monastic. Uh, and uh, it is, I think, actually, it's very important. It matters a lot how we present the students. Uh, and there is some truth to that. If you talk about the end of suffering, it doesn't sound all that exciting. The end of suffering, so what? It sounds kind of, yeah, what happens then? You're really bored? Is that what happens afterwards? Uh, of course, no, because the flip side of the coin is just as important. And this is the thing that you start to see when you read the suttas in particular, is that the flip side, the opposite of the coin, uh, of the end of suffering, of course, is the highest happiness. And this is kind of the whole point of it. It's not just that suffering ends and then you're kind of really bored for the rest of your life. No, not at all. It actually you have achieved the highest happiness. You have basically achieved the purpose, the goal, the meaning of what life is all about. And this is why it actually is very powerful. So by using, by being skillful in how we read the suttas and how we present them, I think we can actually uh, draw people on board in a much more powerful way. This is so important, yeah? This is, after all, about <coughs> providing humanity, providing animals, everyone with a meaning and purpose, and all the things that we ever wanted are actually found on the Buddhist path. But 
So this it matters a lot to have it presented in a way that actually works for people. Right? They sort of do get to kind of think, wow, this is this is good stuff. Uh, let's uh, let's look at it more closely. Yeah. So this is the gradual training. It takes you all the way to the highest happiness. It's not just the end of suffering, all the way to the end of the path. Uh, and so it's very interesting. Yeah. The whole training is there. Yeah. And as we read the suttas, you will find for yourself that you are at a certain stage on this path, and you will recognize where your problems are, hopefully, as we go through this. Uh, and you will recognize what it is that you have to do uh, to carry on on this path, move forward, move onward, uh, and then towards this promise of the Buddha of something very powerful, beautiful, uh, you know, very awesome. <laughs> As Abraham translates the word Pali word sadhu, he translates that's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty pretty good translation of sadhu. That sadhu sadhu, awesome, awesome. Right? <laughs> and, so this is kind of example of modern translation, which is very nice in my opinion. So the gradual training is there. The full training is there. What is the gradual training? The gradual training is an expanded expression of the noble eightfold path. So really, it is just an alternative way of looking at the Noble Eightfold Path, but drawing out all the implications of the Noble Eightfold Path. And uh, of course, the Noble Eightfold Path is then really uh, you know, a fundamental part of the teaching. It's part of the uh, Four Noble Truths and all of that. So, so what we're looking at here is really core aspects of the teaching. So, and you may ask yourself, you may <coughs> wonder, how do I know what is core Buddhism? Even if we can first of all agree that the four Nikayas, this is kind of the word of the Buddha, and I will explain later on how we can know this, but even then, there's a lot to read. Yeah, how many pages is there in the four Nikayas? There's maybe, uh, uh, they say, I think it says a million words or something. Yeah, is it, you know, 10,000? Uh, how many pages is there in there? Uh, or I'm not sure now. There's, there's so many, there's thousands, maybe five, two, four, four three, five, six thousand pages, something like that. Uh, and uh, it's not that much once you start reading it. You go through it fairly fast, but still it's a lot. Uh, yeah, and there are some, there are, there's a fair variety of teachings in there. Uh, how do we know which ones we should focus on? Uh, how do we know which ones are really essential? Are they all equally essential? If you come to some kind of mythological, or legendary uh, sutta, is that as important as the Noble Eightfold Path or whatever else? Uh, how do we know this? And one way of knowing this uh, is uh, uh, to look at those things that the Buddha explains again and again in various settings uh, with slight variations on the theme. And yeah, as you go through them, and those things that are occurring in many, many places in the sutras uh, that we are taught to different kinds of people with slight variations on the theme, uh, these are the things that are really crucial and essential. Because the Buddha, but that's obviously why he explains it so many times, yeah? Because uh, it is something that everybody needs to hear. Yeah? So this is one way of deciding this. And the gradual training yeah, is one of these things that uh, occur in many, many places in the suttas. In the Diga Nikaya, long discourse, it occurs about 12 times. In the Majjhima Nikaya, another 10 times. In the Gutra Nikaya, once or twice. But these are short suttas, so, so you don't find the long teachings in there. So it's a lot, yeah, maybe about 25, 30 times in the sutta or something like that. Yeah. So very important for that reason. Uh, is it a little bit colder? Is that, yeah, should we t maybe turn it down a little bit? Well, who is in charge of the aircon? Is anyone in charge of the aircon? Yeah. Yes, okay. You're taking charge anyway. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> People were looking a little bit cold, they're kind of concerned. I don't freeze easily. Yeah. I have Norwegian <laughs> things, that sort of helps. It don't freeze so easily when you have Norwegian things. But yeah, theoretically, practice, of course, it's not really true at all. Anyway, so um, now let us have a look at these background suttas that I have mentioned before. Yeah. And uh, the first one, and these are suttas I kind of tend to read out on the, uh, most. Retreats, you know, I always vary things a little bit, but they are the sort of standard things that I like to point out. And the first one here is from the, uh, you see the little number at the top there, AN5.79. And usually during the retreat, somebody always asks, what do these things mean? This kind of AN and these numbers there. 
what they mean, these are references to enable you to look up the suttas for yourself later on. Uh, so A.N. refers to Anguttara Nikaya, these are the numerical discourses of the Buddha. Uh, yeah, for all the suttas I'm, gonna, uh, I'm teaching here are, are collected, are drawn from four collections of the Buddha. Numerical discourses, connected discourses, long discourses, and mid-length discourses. Uh, so A.N. is a reference to numerical discourses. Uh, the numerical discourses is divided up into 11 chapters. Uh, yeah? And this is the fifth chapter, that's why you have the five there, uh, numerical discourses, book of fives. Uh, and then the last number, 79, that refers to the number of the specific sutta, the specific teaching given by the Buddha. This is the 79th teaching, the 79th sutta, and Guttara finds it. Yeah, for those of you not familiar with this, and actually it is a bit complicated sometimes, at least in the beginning, to find your way through the suttas, but that's what that means. Uh. And this particular sutta is called the Anagata Vayani in Pali, that means like future fears, and future perils, and future dangers, if you like. Yeah. And um, so this is all about the dangers for the sasana and for Buddhism in future times. So, and guess what? Uh, now we are in the future. Yeah, because this is two and a half thousand years ago, so we are in the future. This is kind of pretty relevant for us. So, so uh, uh, we are. So this is why these things actually matter. And what you will see here very quickly is that these things certainly have arisen. So this is what the Buddha has to say. Bhikkhus. Bhikkhus means monks. And uh, I should maybe uh, stop right there, first of all, because uh, uh, first of all, straight away, when a sutta starts off with bhikkhus, uh, and the Buddha is addressing the monks, straight away people start to feel excluded. They say, I'm not a bhikkhu. Yeah, if this is only for the bhikkhus, I'm the only one here. No, everyone else is kind of outside there. That's pretty unfair, isn't it? So why am I talking to myself or what? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. So, but remember, the way that this Pali Suttas work yeah, is that it is the main audience that is always addressed in the Suttas. So when the Buddha says bhikkhus, it doesn't mean that it's just bhikkhus in the assembly. There would very likely be bhikkhunis there, because the monks, the Buddha, would regularly give teachings to the bhikkhunis. And often the lay people would come to the monastery in those days. This is an ancient tradition of Buddhism, that the lay people would come to the monastery and to receive teachings by the monks on the Uposatha days. The Uposatha days are the days on the, you have the full moon, or the new moon, or the half moon, yeah? The lay people come to the monastery here, yeah? and the monks will give a teaching, or the nuns will give a teaching to the lay people there. Yeah? So very often, what you would have, you would have the fourfold assembly actually coming to these kind of teachings. So, so when the Buddha says bhikkhus, what he is addressing the bhikkhus, because they are the most senior, the most numerous probably part of the audience, uh, and that is why they are addressed in this way. Yeah, yeah? so you are like honorary bhikkhus when the Buddha says this. So every one of you, honorary bhikkhu, as far as this is concerned. Uh, it's quite nice, isn't it? Uh, yeah, honorary bhikkhu. Uh, you feel like an honorary bhikkhu? Uh, yeah, anyway, if you don't, whatever. You are an honorary bhikkhu whether you want to or not, because you're going to listen to this teaching. So, <coughs> so uh, bhikkhus, this is the first one just to be aware of that as you as we look at this. There are these five future perils uh, as yet unarisen that will arise in the future. Uh, you should recognize them and make an effort to abandon them. Uh, yeah, so watch out for these things. Uh, make sure that these things are not causing problems for you in the future. Uh, what are these five? Okay. Uh, uh, so he can start off with again, because there's five, this is the fourth one that I'm looking at here. In the future, there will be bhikkhus who are undeveloped in body, virtuous behavior, mind and wisdom. When those discourses spoken by the Tathagata are being recited and, and are deep, deep in meaning, world transcending, connected with emptiness, uh, they will not want to listen to them, will not lend an ear to them, uh, or apply their minds to understand them. Uh, they will not think those teachings to be studied and learned. Yeah, so this is, a, you can see, this is a danger for the future, that people are not interested in the words of the Buddha. And that's basically what this is all about. Uh, and uh, just to, I'll, I'll stop there, because if I read too much, we'll just get uh, too much information straight away. Uh, so just 
starting off with this idea of being undeveloped in body, virtuous behavior, mind and wisdom. And of course this is all about the practice of the path. So what it means is that in the future <coughs> there will be monastics especially. Again, it also means lay people, but it primarily means the monastics because they tend to be the carrier. If any, anyone is a carrier of the Buddhist tradition, it is the monastics who are the carriers of these things. So in the future, there will be monastics who have not practiced the path fully. This is what this means. Undeveloped in body does not mean you haven't been to the gym or done weights. Yeah, there's nothing that. Yeah, it means that it, it is a kind of a curious expression, isn't it? Undeveloped in body. Uh, the Pali word is kaya, and kaya has this very kind of broad meaning in Pali. What it actually means is more like the body in the sense of uh, uh, your personality is what it means. Uh, and it refers specifically usually to things like sense restraint. Uh, in other words, the ability to keep an even mind in daily life, not being carried away by the desires and aversions in life. That's really what it refers to. Uh, so it is an aspect in many ways of virtue, uh, because the mental side of virtue is also uh, the mental side of <coughs> morality is also virtue you know, according to the Buddhist tradition. Uh, development in mind uh, means basically samadhi, uh, yeah, samatha. Uh, the uh, you know the first two things like the jhanas and that kind of thing. Uh, and last, lastly the development of wisdom. Uh, well ultimately what it refers to are the awakening experience themselves. Uh, yeah, so when you don't develop these things, uh, yeah, uh, <coughs> then uh, because you have no real feeling for the teachings of the Buddha, someone who is awakened would naturally be drawn to the teachings of the Buddha because they would know exactly what they are about. Uh, that is why when you reach a state of awakening, that's when you know that the Buddha was awakened. Why? Because you recognize your own path, you recognize what you have done in the suttas. Uh, there's a match there. And you understand only someone who practiced in the same way could have that kind of insight, that kind of understanding of reality. Uh, so only when you have that do you fully understand what the Buddha is about, and that is why you also appreciate his teachings fully at that particular point. So it is so important to practice the path. Without the practicing of the path, the whole thing tends to collapse, it falls apart. And this is one of those beautiful things about Buddhist teaching, even in the present day, is that on the one hand, we have these ancient teachings that have proven their worth over two and a half thousand years. Yeah? We have seen people achieving these states of samadhi and insight over a long period of time. Uh, and this is recorded uh, in the, from the very early times uh, in things like the Theragata and Ter Theragata, uh, where the ancient monastics would kind of speak spontaneous verses uh, of appreciation of what the Dhamma is all about. Uh, and throughout Buddhist history, this has kind of been happening. Yeah? And it is happening in the present day. What is marvelous, and I, you know, I can't, and it's very hard for me to kind of guarantee this to you, of course, you can't you really have to understand this for yourself to some extent, but there are people, even in the present day, who still have these kind of insights. Yeah, not many, I have to warn you, it's pretty few and far between these days. It's not easy to find these people, but they still exist. The tradition is still alive, and this combination of an ancient tradition that comes from the past uh, over two and a half thousand years that is still alive in the present day because we do, we're still getting the same things is extraordinarily powerful. It's powerful for a number of reasons. It's powerful, first of all, because uh, uh, you know one of the dangers in uh, any kind of religious practice is the idea of becoming cultish. Uh, you get personality cults, certain people, you know, are very, they're very charismatic or they have something special. People are drawn to them personally. Uh, but the idea of the Buddhism is that we all ultimately take refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha. We take refuge in something larger than individuals. So if Buddhism becomes too much of a personality cult, and this does happen in Buddhism, yeah, we should watch out for that. Yeah? We should not place complete confidence. We shouldn't have the final faith in individuals, but in the, the triple gem, the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, headed by the Buddha himself. Yeah? So because we are looking back to something which goes back two and a half thousand years, uh, it's a safeguard against personality cults. Uh, it's a safeguard against becoming cultish. Uh, because we all, every one of us, whether you are monastic, even if you're an arahant, uh, we all, in a sense, at the end of the day, we pay respect to the Buddha uh, and take the Buddha as our teacher. Uh, it's incredibly useful uh, and it uh, takes away so many of the dangers that otherwise exist uh, in Buddhism, in the spiritual world everywhere. Uh, 
And you find this across the board. I mean, I, I think, I don't want to say anything particularly bad about Tibetan Buddhism. There's a lot of nice things to be said about Tibetan Buddhism. But I think one of the dangers in Tibetan Buddhism is this idea of the guru being paramount. Yeah, in Tibetan Buddhism, instead of having the triple gem, you have like the four gems, and the fourth one is like the guru. That's pretty much what they say. And I think that is where you have lost sight of what Buddhism is about. Unfortunately, it also happens in other kinds of Buddhism as well. It happens in Theravada Buddhism too. Yeah, there is often this personality cult also happening in Theravada Buddhism. So it happens everywhere. And uh, I think one of the jobs is if you are a teacher in Buddhism, and if people want to get too close to you and want to take you as a personal teacher, it's the same now. Don't take me as a personal teacher. Take the Buddha as a teacher. Now. It even happens to me. People come up to me and say, oh, I want to take you as my teacher. I say, no, don't take me as a teacher. Now. Take the Buddha as a teacher. If you want to ask me for advice, I'm happy to help you out. But that is not how you should practice the Buddhist path. It's already extraordinarily valuable. But the other side of this coin is that uh, the, it is alive. And this is also so important. Because uh, when you read the suttas for yourself without having a sense that these teachings are alive, uh, then they can be dry. Yeah, it's just a black ink on white paper or pixels on the screen or whatever kind of medium you use. And uh, it is not the same as seeing these things in reality. When you see people who live these teachings, who have practiced these teachings, uh, who have a sense of the qualities that you read about there, you can almost see them in that person. Uh, it gives rise to a confidence that these things are real in a very different way from when you just read about them. Uh, yeah, and this, of course, is very important as well. There's a place somewhere where the Buddha says something like, even just seeing an arahant in the world is of great benefit. Because when you see an arahant, what you see is basically you see these teachings uh, as a reality, as they, you know, as they actually are expressed through personal practice and through uh, the uh, uh, understanding and coming to uh, this particular insights and meditation that the suttas actually talk about. Uh, so this also becomes very important. Uh, so this is the beauty of this, 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 this duality between uh, the, the, lived ex the, the, the lived reality of these things plus the ancient uh, teachings coming together it makes it extremely powerful in my opinion. Uh, anyway, I've got to go a little bit faster than this, otherwise we're we'll going to be here forever on this retreat. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so this is what the idea of uh, being undeveloped in these things. Because you are undeveloped in these things, uh, you don't really appreciate the Buddha's teachings. Yeah, some of the Buddha speaks, you're like, yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah, I've heard this before. You, you said this before, Master, give us some new teachings. Yeah? It's, it, <laughs> you, know, you know the feeling? Yeah. Do you want to turn it off? You may be able to turn it off. Is that possible? Can't turn it off anymore. Wow, this is Mara. Mara is. <laughs> 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 Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. So otherwise we get pneumonia and we will stay in bed for the rest of the retreat, which is not such a good idea. So, uh, because of that, uh, yeah, you don't appreciate the word of the Buddha, because you don't really, you know, you think the Buddha is repetitive, you think, yeah, and he is quite repetitive. And this is why, when I do retreats, I don't feel so bad about reading the same suttas on every retreat, mm -hmm. then, yeah? The Buddha did it, if the Buddha did it, surely I can do it as well. Then. So if you get bored, yeah, with the suttas, if you've heard, my, you've heard me do the suttas before, you get bored, it is not my fault, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so try, this is, the, this is what I find is wonderful about this sutta. You can actually read the same sutta, if you read it with this idea of a beginner's mind, yeah? You read it with an idea of understanding it more deeply, the same sutta can be actually inspiring again and again and again. Right? But you not too often, not if you read it every day, of course, uh, but if you hear it like once a year or something, uh, it can be inspiring all the time. Uh, this is kind of having the right attitude to these things. Uh. Anyway, so the discourse is spoken by the Tathagata. Tathagata is the Buddha. This is how the Buddha refers to himself. This is an ancient word in Buddhism that was used prior to Buddhism. And it was a way of speaking about someone who was fully enlightened, a great spiritual teacher. They were called Tathagatas. And the Buddha used that word also for himself. So when his discourses are spoken, that are deep and deep in meaning. Yeah, they're not just superficially deep, but they actually are profoundly deep. 
Yeah, this is a, a, an important distinction. Uh, uh, be careful. So very often you will read things that sound very profound and very deep. Gambina is the Pali word. It means like profound, basically. Uh, and uh, sometimes you read it that sounds really profound. Yeah, you read, maybe you read a beautiful verse about something, or somebody says something which is kind of mind-boggling, but somehow it feels profound. Uh, be careful with those things, uh, because often what sounds profound actually isn't very profound. Uh, and one of the kind of the things that comes to mind always when I say this is the uh, that, you know, that's Gavi like Osho, I don't know if you, you know Osho, the uh, Rajneesh, the kind of the great guru who, back in the 70s and 80s. And, and uh, he, uh, uh, he, one of his sayings was that, uh, I'm so detached, I'm not even attached to detachment. Uh, wow, <laughs> profound, yeah, wow, not even attached to detachment, yeah. And of course, what that meant for him, uh, yeah, because some people challenged him, well, how come we have so many Rolls Royces? Uh, he was, he was the, the, the person in the world who had the most Rolls Royces. He was supposed to be a spiritual guru. He had 92 Rolls Royces, something like that. There, there was recently, I, I don't know, there's a, recently been a TV series about it. I haven't seen it, but apparently it kind of was quite uh, revealing about what was going on in that cult. But he had 92 Rolls Royces. And of course, then you have to come up with excuses. Yeah, I'm so detached. I'm not even attached to detachment. Uh, yeah, and it, it makes it sound profound while at the same time it excuses your a slightly uh, unfortunate behavior. Yeah. I'm just putting it politely. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> and this is and this is kind of the point. We have to uh, you have to really search out those teachings that actually are profound in a very real sense. Uh, and uh, this is often quite hard. It takes discernment. It takes intelligence. It takes you know, not kind of ordinary intelligence, but kind of wisdom intelligence to look at these things in a way and really understand whether they are profound or not. So use that discernment in your mind. Don't be afraid of being uh, not super critical, but at least critical enough to be able to distinguish between those things that matter and those things that don't matter. Yeah. The Buddha's teachings are deep, not only superficially, but deep in a very real sense. Uh, they are world transcending. Uh, this is Lokutara in Pali, and uh, what this means is that they lead beyond the world. Yeah, and they lead beyond the world in a kind of gradual way. Uh, the first kind of world that we leave behind is the world of the five senses, uh, the Kama Loka, Kama Vachara. Uh, and uh, this is what the world that you leave behind when you start to enter Samadhi. Yeah, you're starting to transcend the world already as you attain Samadhi. So if you get a little bit of a glimpse of Samadhi, you already have some idea what it means to transcend the world. Uh, yeah, and it's blimmin marvelous to transcend the world. Yeah, it's really nice. Uh, <laughs> you're going beyond you're going beyond suffering, yeah, and, and actually it's very powerful and beautiful. Uh, that is the first one. And then of course not only do you transcend the uh, world of karma, the world of the five senses, then you transcend also the world of samadhi and the world of even more profound samadhi beyond that uh, until the entirety of the world, absolutely everything is transcended, everything is left behind. Uh, and that is where you achieve the highest happiness. Uh, so it is a gradual movement out of the world, uh, starting with the most basic aspects of it until everything is left behind. Uh, the word world in Pali, loka, is very similar to the way we use world in English. Uh, you know, probably actually most languages we use the word world in this way. It, it means different things depending on context. Yeah, so you know the world can be in the planet Earth, it can be in humanity, or it can be in the cosmos, it can be in many different things. And then the same thing in Buddhism also has similar kind of expansive meanings depending on the context. So world transcending here literally means abandoning, going beyond the world. Connected with emptiness. And this is one of the uh, things, the distinguishing marks of the Buddhist teaching, this idea of emptiness. Uh, in uh, Buddhism, uh, or in the early Buddhist suttas, uh, the word emptiness is synonymous with non-self. Uh, yeah, non-self, anatta, uh, is uh, uh, one of the three characteristics of existence. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, in other words, referring to the, uh, the, the uh, Buddhist idea, the insight into uh, your own experience as having no inherent essence. There's nothing essential in your experience that is always there. Nothing that you can kind of point back to as the real, ultimate thing, which is the real you. Yeah, and this is the same as sunya. Sunya ta in the early Buddhist, that's really all it refers to, it means to that. So this here is what we're right here, the reason this is mentioned here, because this is, if anything, a 
points to what Buddhism is about, this is what points to laughter. This is kind of the thing which is the, the characteristic which is different from Buddhism uh, to all other philosophies essentially, uh, the idea of non-self. Uh, this is why this is mentioned specifically here. So sunyata, emptiness. Uh, yeah, and um, I don't know how much I should go into that now, but uh, sometimes people think that uh, words like non-self or emptiness, they are kind of scary now. Yeah, it's kind of scary because non-self, gee, I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure I want to go there, non-self, I'd rather have a real happy self, yeah? Most people have, want to have a real happy self, they don't want to have, go to where there's absolutely no self. Emptiness, what exactly that, will that mean? It sounds kind of, depending on how you approach it, it can sound scary. So what we, a very important point, especially for those of you who are a little bit more new to these teachings, uh, it's very important to approach them in the right way. If you approach them in the wrong way, they sound scary and you're going to leave. You, you know, by the end of the retreat, you're going to be gone. Uh, but if you approach them in the right way, you're actually going to be inspired by the end of the retreat. Uh, so the way to approach a thing like non-self and emptiness uh, is to understand that these things are gradual things that happen you know, over a long period of time. It's a grad gradual movement towards non-self and towards emptiness. Uh, and one of the things I would like you to notice during this retreat uh, is how beautiful it is uh, when you start to become peaceful in your meditation. Yeah, I'm sure all of you already know that to some extent. Yeah, You've done some meditation, sometimes you feel peaceful. Uh, what does it feel like? It feels wonderful. Yeah, it feels, wow, this is really it. Uh, you know, this is where I want to go. I will take this even further. Uh, so what is that? What is it that when you become more peaceful? What it is, uh, it's more non-self. Yeah, I'm not sure more non-self, maybe that's the wrong way of looking at it, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an aspect of non-self, because when you become peaceful, uh, your thoughts are dying down, uh, your experience is becoming more refined, uh, there's less experience going on, uh, so there's less personality in there, there's less of you in there, it's, it's, you are starting to move towards non-self, and it feels incredibly nice. This is what I mean by taking a practical approach to this very profound teaching. So, and sunyata is exactly the same thing. As you uh, go deeper in your meditation practice, uh, it's as if your experience is emptying out. Uh, there's less things happening, which means that your experience is emptying out. Uh, you are free of the experience of the city. Yeah, there's no city here. You are free of the experience of the noise of the city. Uh, yeah, whatever that is. Uh, it's actually quite nice and peaceful here. Uh, yeah. And so you are descending, if you like, into uh, uh, emptiness. Uh, and you start to understand how marvelous this actually is. Uh, this is the right approach. Uh, rather than philosophizing about it, you're going to tie yourself up, up into knots if you're trying to philosophize about non-self, because really it is an experiential thing, something ultimately you have to know through direct experience. Uh, if you're trying to kind of figure it out and uh, try to make yourself non-self non by philosophizing about it, uh, you're not going to succeed. Uh, you're just going to fall into despair and think, help, what is going on? Uh, that's what's going to happen. Then. So, but, uh, so this is the right way of approaching these things. And then you start to get the feeling for what these teachings are about. And then you just extrapolate into the future. Yeah, if I continue doing this, uh, what's going to happen then? And you start to understand that this is actually something very uh, profound and very beautiful. Then. So connect through with emptiness. Uh, and uh, despite these things being this uh, powerful teachings of the Buddha, you don't listen to them because you have no appreciation of what is going on. You don't lend an ear. You don't apply your minds to understand. You don't think those teachings should be studied and learned. Yeah, and um, so what you are seeing here is this uh, uh, general idea in Buddhism that when you come to the Dhamma, it is actually, it takes quite a bit of a uh, very important part of the Buddhist practice is not just to listen to a Dhamma talk or just to meditate or just to practice. Uh, reflection and contemplation is a very important part of these teachings. Uh, yeah, and this is, uh, this is what the Buddha is saying here. First you listen, yeah? then you apply your mind to understand. Uh, yeah? And after a while, you, uh, uh, part of that you learn and you study these teachings. In other words, you reflect on them. Uh, you try to figure out what they mean, especially what they mean for you, how you can apply them in your life, uh, how you can straighten out your view, how you can reduce your delusion by seeing a teaching that uh, uh, you, know, you, uh, you have a sense of faith and trust in her. 
So, and this is an important part, very important part of these teachings. And this is actually one of the reasons why I also enjoy, I enjoy doing retreats because it gives me an opportunity to, and when I teach others, I have to think about these things, yeah. And I have to reflect on these things. And I find it very, uh, often very nourishing and very, it's very, it's a great thing to do for my own practice as well. Uh, so actually, uh, you know, for me, it brings a lot of happiness to be able to teach retreats. So simply because I have to think about these teachings myself. Uh, so contemplate these teachings, reflect on them. Uh, so much of the path is actually reflection, not just on the teaching, but also on how they relate to you. Uh, looking at um, uh, learning how to overcome the hindrances inside of you, the defilements inside of you, actually takes a lot of reflection as well. Uh. Okay. So, so we don't listen to those teachings, yeah, or some people don't anyway, yeah, but so what, do, what do we listen to? Well, what we listen to is this. Uh, but when those discourses are being recited, uh, that are mere poetry, composed by poets, beautiful in words and phrases, uh, created by outsiders, uh, spoken by disciples, uh, they will want to listen to them, lend an ear to them, and apply their minds to understand them. Uh, they will think those teachings should be studied and learned. Yeah, so uh, these are, uh, you know, poetry composed by poets, beautiful in words and phrases. And we know what that is. Uh, you know, it's very attractive sometimes to read beautiful poetry, uh, and you find also quite a lot of beautiful spiritual poetry as well. Uh, it is out there in various traditions, you know, uh, we were just discussing Rumi, you know, the Rumi is one of these kind of mystical saints of, uh, of, uh, is, of the Islam. Uh, and uh, sure, of course, there is uh, things in there which may be very beautiful uh, and may even be very useful. Uh, but uh, the point here is that the point is not so much that we should not read those teachings at all. Of course you can. Uh, that is not the problem. The point is that you take that as your main refuge. Uh, that is when it becomes problematic. Uh, you're listening to that, and the word of the Buddha kind of is kind of boring and bland, yeah? So you go to these other teachings instead. Uh, that is where it becomes problematic. Uh, and we tend to be naturally drawn to things that are beautiful. Uh, human beings, we seek beauty in the world. Yeah? This is what desire is all about, seeking out things that attract us. And that's why we are naturally drawn towards anything which is beautiful and nice. Uh, so poetry uh, is often like that. Uh, of course, we also have beautiful poetry in Buddhism as well. Now, if you read like the Dhammapada, for example, yeah, often very, often very nice, both beautiful, inspiring, and profound at the same time. Uh, I mentioned before the Theragata, the uh, Theragata, uh, uh, the verses of the ancient uh, monks and nuns. It's supposed to, supposed to be arahants, uh, also very nice. Uh, yeah, you have the things like the Sutta Nipata, for example, in the Pali language. Uh, also, uh, ancient texts which often can be beautiful. So we have those inspiring verses in Buddhism as well. Uh, so uh, read those if you want something inspiring, and then you get a bit of uh, inspiration and also the Buddhist teachings at the same time. Uh, there is an important distinction between uh, poetry on the one hand and ordinary prose on the, on the other hand. Uh, yeah, poetry is meant to be inspiring, but the problem with poetry is that poetry is constricted by the rules of poetry here. And the rules of poetry in the Pali language is that it has to have a certain rhythm. Yeah? So it's restricted by the syllables, by the number of syllables, by the length of the syllables, and this kind of thing. So, so if you want to express the Dhamma in a very, uh, uh, in a very kind of direct, in an immediate way, yeah? in a most precise way, you don't find that in poetry, because poetry is not really meant to do that. Uh, the way you find that is in the prose passages in the Pali Canon. Uh, so uh, read poetry, uh, but remember poetry is often meant to inspire you. It's meant to kind of get you down, get you in a good mood so you can sit and get some nice meditation afterwards. Uh, it is not meant to give you the most precise description of what Buddhism is about. Uh, that you find in the prose passages. Uh. Yeah, so keep that in mind, because very often people, they, it's easy to read too much into poetry here. Uh, uh, let the prose be the main thing which in, uh, informs you as far as doctrine or Buddhism is concerned. Uh. So, uh, again, the point here is not to say you should never read anything outside of Buddhism, any poetry and all these kind of things. Uh, it's just to know where your main refuge is. That's really the point of this. Uh. Created by outsiders. Yeah, outsiders, who are they? Well, they are everyone, anyone who's not a 
Buddhist basically, yeah, from a Buddhist point of view, they are outsiders. Yeah. So if you kind of all you do is read about Hindu sages and Christian mystics from the Middle Ages, uh, and that's where you kind of find your mainstay in your practice, well that, then you are taking refuge in the outsiders uh, rather than the refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So again, it's okay to read some of this stuff, uh, but don't make it your main thing. Yeah. I was always a bit shocked, actually. I, one of the reasons I think I, I, I started out <coughs> in, the, in the UK, in the, and then I left for Australia later on and became a disciple of Ajahn Brahm, and I was always a, a bit surprised at the very, uh, when I started out on this path, and I realized how many, even monks, actually get very uh, excited by all of these external teachings. Uh, and then, but, then, but then when I started to read the suttas, I actually realized that often the, these external teachings can be problematic yeah, and often they can go very much against the idea of the Buddhist path. Uh, I remember one of the books, I think we even have it in our library in Perth, or maybe we have, maybe we don't anymore, we used to have it in our library, it's okay to have it there, yeah, as a kind of reference or whatever. Yeah. And this was this very famous Indian sage, uh, as a, uh, a fellow called uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj or something like that. Yeah. I don't remember exactly what his name is, something like that. And the title of the book was I Am That. Yeah, I Am That is the title of the book. Yeah. So, okay, so is, is, that, is that okay or not? And then I started reading the suttas. And then, then you go to the suttas, and then this one sutta, it actually says specifically, the thought, I Am That, is a delusion, it's a papancha, it is a proliferation, it is a vacillation of unison. Yeah, and I thought, cheaper is the title of the book. Yeah, the very kind of the first thing you see it from a Buddhist point of view actually is a wrong view. It is a mistake. It doesn't actually work like that. But this is kind of the idea between you know going back to the suttas and then comparing it to other teachings is that it gives you a possibility, an opportunity to find out what are the real profound teachings. To me, it was an eye-opener, because I didn't really understand at the beginning what I was supposed to read, not read it. And when I saw that, I thought, okay, well, now I understand what is going on here. So, um, anyway, just to give an example of how easy it is to go wrong sometimes, uh, unless you have a proper foundation in, uh, uh, in the word of the Buddha. Next one, spoken by disciples. Uh, yeah, and this, I think, is one of the most interesting ones right here. Uh, because if you look at the world of Buddhism uh, today and you ask yourself who almost everyone listens to, uh, yeah, who do people take as, your as their teachers usually? Oh, my teacher is, uh, you know, Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, that's my, te my teacher. Uh, my teacher is uh, uh, Sayado so-and-so, or it is uh, Aya so-and-so, or it is Lama so-and-so, or it is, uh, you know, whoever. It's everyone basically except one person. Uh, it's everyone except the Buddha. Have you ever heard anyone say, I think the Buddha is my teacher? Nobody ever says that. Uh, if you ask me, I might just say it. I might be the only one, you know, one of the few who actually say that, but very few people say that. Uh, and it's kind of strange because this is exactly what the Buddha is kind of right here, he's warning against. Uh, yeah, you listen to the disciples, but you don't listen to the Buddha himself. Uh, so this is a very uh, important problem. It is something that we see around the world. Uh, so what it actually means, yeah, it means that you should stop listening to me right now. Is that what it means? That's what it means, yeah. I, I'm being really hypocritical. I say you shouldn't listen to disciples, and I'm talking so much. Uh, there's something wrong with it. But the point is not, again, that you should never listen to any disciples. Uh, the point, rather, is that you know where your main refuge is. Uh, your main refuge is with the word of the Buddha. And the word of the disciples of the Buddha, they should be seen in that context, in light of what the Buddha taught. Uh, and then uh, the context is right. And then you know how to deal with these teachings. Uh. And uh, so much in the history of Buddhism is the word of disciples. Uh. Yeah, everything that has come down to us, uh, that comes after the time of the Buddha, really is the teaching of the disciples. Uh starting with the very first things, the very first suttas that were not part of the Pali Canon from the beginning, yeah. uh, including the Abhidhamma, including the Vasudhimagga, including the commentaries, including the Mahayana suttas, including all the modern teachings, uh, including all the commentators, uh, including the very latest commentary on the suttas, uh, which is what? Uh, what I'm saying right now. There's the very latest commentary on the suttas. Yeah, uh, that's another one there. Uh, remember that. It's just the commentary on the suttas. What I'm saying is it's a bit similar to the ancient commentaries, yeah? Just another person commenting on the suttas, really. Yeah. 
So that's how you should understand what I'm saying. A commentary on the sutta, that's really all that is there. And then you have the right attitude to these things. So everything in Buddhism, almost, almost everything we do, is based on what the disciples say. And so little is actually based on what the Buddha himself said. So remember that. It's a very uh, useful piece of advice when you, uh, you know what your priorities should be, where you take your final refuge as a uh, practitioner of the Buddhist path. Uh, <coughs> if we don't do that, we have no gold standard. We have no, uh, we have not nowhere to actually go. How to judge teachings? How to, uh, you know, uh, figure out what actually is real? Uh, it's impossible to know. Uh, all you do is, okay, my teacher is so wonderful. Yeah, we all think our teachers are wonderful. My teacher is so enlightened. Uh, how do you know? I just know. I just look. Look my teacher in the eye and know that they are enlightened. <laughs> Be careful of that. Yeah, you can see how dangerous the reason you laugh is because you understand straight away how dangerous it is. Uh, yeah, and uh, this is the problem. Often we don't. Often we are deluded about where the real arahants are and where the real teachings are. Yeah? And this is the problem. Uh, so ultimately, you have to come back to the stand gold standard for this. What are the real teachings? Uh, so, spoken by the disciples, and so you listen to them, you lend an ear to that, uh, and then you uh, forget about the real teachings. And then uh, the Buddha says, thus because uh, through corruption of the Dhamma comes corruption of the discipline. Uh, the training is a much better translation. And from the corruption of the training comes the corruption of the teaching. Teaching is the Dhamma just teaching. Yeah. This is the fourth future peril as yet unarisen that will arise in the future. You should recognize it and make an effort to abandon it. Mm -hmm. So through a corruption of the Dhamma, yeah, you, in other words, you don't listen to the word, the word I listen to all other kinds of stuff. So the teaching gets corrupted. And because the teaching is corrupted, the training, the practice gets corrupted. The word put, used here, discipline, is actually the Pali word is vinaya. And for those of you who are interested in monasticism, I know that there are a few of you who are kind of heading in that direction, and what a wonderful thing that is. It's wonderful to be able to give teachings to people who are really inspired by these things. It's wonderful. All of you are included, of course, but it's, it's particularly nice when people are actually kind of moving towards the monastic life. It's a wonderful thing to see that. So, uh, to, uh, the word vinaya, if you, are, if you know a little bit about monasticism, usually it is taken to mean the uh, the kind of the training, the rules of training, all of these kind of things, how we act as communities and all of these things. Uh, that's why it is translated here as discipline. Uh, but actually the word vinaya in the very earliest suttas uh, actually doesn't really refer to that. Uh, and right here, the context here makes it fairly clear that it doesn't actually refer to that. What it refers to is the training that we go through, the practice. Uh, so Dhamma is the doctrine, Dhamma is a teaching of the Buddha, Vinaya is a practical expression of those teachings through our practice. It's a training that we undergo, and it includes the entire Noble Eightfold Path, and it includes the entire gradual training. That is what it really refers to in this context. So, um, uh, so when the teachings are wrong, yeah, you're going to practice wrongly because you don't, don't know what to do. Huh? Yeah, you kind of you, you whatever. I don't know what happens. Maybe you kind of see the you see the soul or something in there. Yeah, oh, I found the soul. Then I'm happy, you know. This is good. But actually, the Buddha doesn't say we should find the soul. Yeah, it's like that is how things go wrong. Yeah. And then because you practice wrongly, you don't actually realize these teachings. Because you don't realize them, you don't know what the Dhamma is. You don't know what the teachings are. Because you don't know what the teachings are, the teachings get corrupted. So practice and doctrine, teaching and theory, always have to go together and they support each other. That's really what the Buddha is saying here. So, uh, this is the fourth peril in the future. And you can see how foresightful this is. Because uh, this is exactly what is happening in the world. Yeah? This is exactly the problem. Yes, it is good. Actually, these days, there is a lot of movement towards uh, uh, going back to the early teachings of the Buddha. Uh, yeah, this is happening in a, uh, in a number of places. And uh, it's a wonderful thing that is. Uh, uh, and it is happening in the, you know, People like Ajahn Brahm, for example, has always been very strong about the suttas and, and early Buddhism. I really just got, got it from Ajahn Brahm. And Ajahn Brahm said, this is what you should do. I said, yes, sir, and that's what I do. That's how I work. Yeah, I'm a very, very obedient student. If you say that Ajahn Brahm, he will say, no, he is not obedient at all. Mm -hmm. you know, he, he, he asks too many questions. He argues too much. That's what Ajahn Brahm will say. But um, I say, I, I, I disagree with that. Term. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I've been making all these students as you can tell that. So, uh, uh, so Adam Brown does that, and I try to follow in that footstep. Yeah, and there are also many other places around the world, like you know, for example, in Sri Lanka. Some of you have a Sri Lankan background, uh, and in Sri Lanka too, there is a lot of interest in the early suttas, uh, and there are many of the monks there who are, you know have a lot of interest in going back to that. Uh, one of the very famous monks of, of uh, Sri, Sri Lanka, a monk called Kiribati Nalananda, very, very famous. Uh, and he is one of those who kind of advocates a lot about going back to the early suttas. Uh, yeah, and there's not only him, uh, there's many others as well. Uh, in Thailand, uh, uh, same thing, there is uh, something called the Buddha Mahashana movement in Thailand, which is again a movement going back to the early suttas. Uh, what is very interesting is, and this is, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but uh, uh, you may think that when I say going back to the suttas, I'm kind of saying Theravada is great and Mahayana is kind of not so good. Uh, but that is not actually what I'm saying here. And what of, because in the, even within the Mahayana tradition, uh, or even within the Chinese canon, uh, the early suttas are actually to be found there too, uh, found in Chinese translation. Uh, and if you ask a, a Chinese monastic or a Chinese master who is knowledgeable about the uh, canon, they too would actually say that the early suttas are precisely those Angamas, those Nikayans. Uh, so this is something everyone agrees on. Yeah? Nobody, if you go to the Dalai Lama, he too will say that probably, yeah? because he knows that these are the early students. Yeah? This is generally universally agreed upon. Yeah? The only thing which is not agreed upon is how much weight we should give to those early teachings. Yeah? That is what is disagreed upon. Yeah? But to me, it is of fundamental importance, yeah? because this is where, obviously, the, the Dhamma really uh, arises from. Yeah? So uh, it is nice to see that around the world we have this movement towards back to the early students. Yeah? It's a beautiful thing to see it because people are appreciating the importance of these things. Uh, sometimes things get too much too complicated, yeah? People say, oh, I should not, I had a question, I should I study the Abhidhamma or not? You know, what do you recommend? But the should I study Abhidhamma? I said, I recommend that you should not study the Abhidhamma. You should specifically avoid it, that's what I recommend. <laughs> I, you know, I, so if you're already studying the Abhidhamma, uh, then, uh, uh, I don't know what to say. I, don't <laughs> <laughs> I, I would not recommend it because there's enough to study already. Yeah, the, the, the four Nikayas are going to sustain you for a lifetime, sustain you for many lifetimes probably. Yeah. The key to the four Nikayas, key to the word of the Buddha. The Abhidhamma is dry. It is really incredibly boring if you ask me. Yeah. And it can be made more interesting if you kind of, you know, if you if you try, of course. Uh, uh, but really, it is. Uh, uh, it is redundant. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the next sutta. I, uh, one hour has almost kind of vanished out of thin air. I don't know what happened to that hour. I wasn't supposed to do just only one paragraph in one hour. And that's <laughs> often what happens. So. Gee, okay. Um, uh, okay, well, that's uh, because uh, I don't really want to go on to the next suit. I will only have five minutes left, so let me talk a little bit just about uh, um, what happens in the next sutta here and show you how it uh, ties in with uh, what I was just talking about now, about the Abhidharma and all, the, all these other things. Uh, and one of the things that the Buddha says uh, expressly in the suttas uh, is, you find this in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which is the great sutta on the Buddha's passing away, the final days of the Buddha. And of course, in the final days of the Buddha, one of the purposes of the Buddha is to lay down how the monastic community, how Buddhism is going to prosper into the future. The Buddha realizes, I'm about to pass away. Because I'm about to pass away, how should I teach the Sangha? What should I take refuge in after I'm gone? They can't really come to me anymore and ask for questions. So what are you going to do? And he specifically says, after I have passed away, yeah, you should take the Dhamma and the Vinaya, the doctrine and the training that I have given you, that should be your teacher in the future. Yeah? And then he specifies, and we'll see this in the next week when we come to this this afternoon, that he specifies that this is a, a basically about the path of practice, the Noble Eightfold Path, the 37 body Pakya Dhammas, the 37 Aids to Awakening, all of that. That is what is that path. Yeah? You don't, you, know, you shouldn't actually go beyond that. You shouldn't take anyone else as your final reference or your final teacher. That is your teacher. Yeah? And interestingly, in this next sutta, he specifically says that what I have taught you is complete. 
There's nothing missing from this. Nothing to be added, nothing to be sub subtracted. What I teach you is just the Four Noble Truths. Why? Because that is what leads you out of suffering. That is what leads you to the highest happiness in the world. Yeah, so these things are complete in their own right. And lo and behold, what happens? As soon as the Buddha passes away, we start thinking, oh gee, these teachings don't seem complete. Yeah, we need to add a little bit to this teaching. Something has been missing here. This is not a complete picture, it's not a complete philosophy. Yeah, all the aspects of existence are not, are not accounted for. We've got to account for everything. And then some very intelligent people, very clever, they sit down and they write down the Abhidhamma. They concoct the Abhidhamma. Maybe concoct is a bit harsh word, but that's basically what it is. They put this together, the Abhidhamma. Why? Because we want a final philosophical system that accounts for all aspects of existence. And then they forget on the way that that is not the purpose of Buddhism. The purpose of Buddhism is not to create this fantastic philosophical system that accounts for all aspects of existence. That's not the point of Buddhism. Yeah, the point of Buddhism is not philosophy, it's not natural science, it's not about understanding the universe, it's not the same as the purpose of scientific inquiry, that is quite different. The purpose of Buddhism is very specific. The purpose of Buddhism is there is a problem. The problem is the problem of suffering, the problem of not having the final happiness in our lives. How do we get there? That is the purpose of Buddhism. So the teachings of Buddhism, therefore, are, can be expected not to be complete from a philosophical point of view. Yeah, because of the point of these teachings. And yet somehow we get kind of, you know, we tend to get carried along with philosophy because it is interesting, because it is kind of exciting, because it is, uh, you know, things that especially if you have a restless mind and you want to, you know, meditation is going so well, okay, let me think about the Dhamma instead. And then you, instead of thinking about the teachings as they are, you start making up new things. And I think this is in a very large part how the Abhidhamma comes about uh, and it creates this kind of beautiful philosophical system uh, and then people think, oh, the Abhidhamma, this is kind of the ultimate expression of the Buddha's teachings. It is not the ultimate expression of the Buddha's teachings. There is only one ultimate expression of the Buddha's teachings. It is found right there in the suttas. That is the ultimate expression of his teachings. So please don't allow yourself to be too sidetracked by these things. Because it is very easy in the world of Buddhism to be led down that way into... Uh, Abhidhamma. I remember I was to, in my lecture recently, I, I traveled quite a lot as a Buddhist monk because I get invited everywhere to give talks and it's a wonderful thing to do that because uh, it's wonderful to be able to share these very powerful and beautiful teachings with everyone. Uh, but uh, sometimes I be, I'm given this incredibly arduous schedule. They say, okay, you start at 9 a.m. and you finish at 7 and you talk all the way in between. Uh, yeah? so they say something like, well, they don't actually say that, but that's kind of the implication of the schedule that they give you. Yeah? Uh, so I, I usually say yes because I like, you know, because I just like to go with the flow, but sometimes I realize I actually can't go with the flow. Sometimes you have to set barriers, otherwise, this gets too much sometimes. Uh, so, but anyway, so, you know, then when you get a little bit of time just to rest and be by yourself, you're so happy just to hang out by yourself for a while because you talk so much, yeah, and you kind of, you have these very intensive kind of uh, sessions that are not really retreats, they're more like a teaching schedule there. And then, when you finally get back to your room and you come to rest, then the Abhidhamikas come, yeah? And, they, and the Abhidhamikas, they are a large group because everyone is really interested in Abhidhamma. Mm. I don't know why, but that's what happened. Because everybody thought Abhidhamma is the best. And then Abhidhamma, because it's so profound, it has to be very loud. So turn up the volume to max. Yeah, I'm sitting in the room next door, and you hear the Abhidhamma through the wall going on for four hours or something. You're supposed to try to have a rest next door. And that's when you... That, that is the way to really to get aversion towards the Abhidhamma. <laughs> the maximum aversion to the Abhidhamma when these things, these things happen. So, but it's, it's fascinating. I, I, I realize, because I was teaching early suttas, and I get really inspired by this, and I find it really beautiful and nice. Uh, and uh, yet, yet, the number of people who came to my suttas classes was less than the people who went to the Abhidhamma class. Uh, I wanted to go out there and kind of tell them, yeah, listen, Guys, yeah, this, everyone, this, you know, you're on the wrong track. Just cancel this, come to my class instead afterwards. No. But you can't really do that. Yeah, I wanted to do it. I was almost kind of out, out of my door, but I thought, no, this is not going to work. You know, forget about it. 
relax, the sit back, and now kind of, you know, patient, patient endurance, and then the Abhidhamma will pass you, actually. <laughs> so don't wait. Let, let's let the Abhidhamma pass as early as quickly, and let's go back to the early sutta. That is really uh, the message of this. So I'm just saying this because it is so, so common in the world to study the Abhidhamma upside down and in all kind of directions, backwards and forwards or whatever. It's so common, and people spend so much time doing this. But Life is already so full, yeah? Life is so full of having to live well, doing the right thing. Uh, even my monastic life is already incredibly full. Uh, there's no way that I really have the time. I don't even have the time to, to study the Abhidhamma, uh, let alone someone who is also working, who has a family life. I should imagine if you are, have a job, you have a family life, all these kind of things. Uh, even more difficult, make sure instead uh, that you use your life fully to develop the path in the right way. Then. Uh, you are spending your time far better than that. So just a little bit of warning about those things, because so many people get kind of seduced by the idea that the Abhidharma is a very useful one. Anyway, uh, that is uh, all for uh, this morning. Yeah. So please keep on enjoying yourself, uh, have a nice lunch, and uh, keep on just going slowly at the beginning. Yeah. So you build up the energy in the mind, and as you do that, uh, you will enjoy your meditation far more. So we'll see you again around 3.30 for the continuing the, the suitors.